I also see a lot of disruption in terms of who those intermediaries were, right? And that was part of the excitement for me about blockchain was this concept of peer to peer. In our world, there was always a switch. There was always an intermediary, right? So to get to you, I had to go to a Visa switch. I had to go to a MasterCard. I had to go to a processor. This is almost like old as new with the first credit unions, right? It's peer to peer. You and I can exchange value as long as we have an internet connection. We're good. You know, we don't necessarily need an intermediary like we did before. Welcome to Humanizing Software, where we explore our ever evolving relationship with technology and its impact on our professional and personal lives hear incredible stories, and gain valuable insights from global industry leaders as we discuss their relationship with software and how it's developed over the course of their career. As technology continues to evolve and brings us closer together, it should enable people to do what they do best while we uncover what they do best with the help of technology. And now your host, Andrew Tall. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And welcome to Tailwind Business Ventures, where we talk about the impact of technology on everyday lives, both from a personal as well as a professional level. If you have any comments, you have any questions, please ask them. Engage, engage. That's something that's so incredibly important for us. And it helps build the conversation. Visit our website at uh, tailwindsw.com, where you'll see an entire channel dedicated to humanizing software. And we have our own YouTube channel as well. Today's guest, I'm extremely excited about, not only because I've had the chance to get to know him very well personally over the last several years, but I respect him as a technology leader and a visionary in so many different areas. He started at SunTrust, continued on with a career at Visa, as well as MasterCard as a senior leader, driving strategy, driving change, and implementing some key policies and procedures, and is now the CEO of Bonafide, where he is leading the charge specifically to privacy, authentication, and really changing the way that people are able to uniquely make sure that they are the right people doing the right things as they engage in their everyday activities. So as we start today's episode, please welcome to the screen, John Ainsworth, CEO of Bonafide. John, good morning. Hey, Andrew. Good morning. Great to see you again, buddy. As well. And as always, John, thank you so much again for joining us. I'm excited to see where our conversation takes us because we've had the opportunity to work together. We've had the opportunity to learn a lot together, see some things that have worked, some things that haven't worked. And I've always viewed your viewpoint on how things are working with ever-changing trends is something to keep an eye on. So excited for our conversation today. Yeah, me too. You're very kind. You're very kind. Excellent. As we do with all of our guests, John, we want to start off with the most important question. Let everybody get a chance to know you. So tell us, who is John Ainsworth? Well, that's a packed question, buddy. (laughs) I'll give you the sanitized version that's for public consumption and not the private consumption. How's that? Uh, We can dip into the private a little bit. That's okay. (laughs) Well, first of all, I have a wonderful wife, Joy. So married, great partner. I have five kids, actually four biological stepdaughter, four girls, and my youngest is a boy who just uh, graduated from high school. So you can imagine the dynamics of that household. My current kids are two little Frenchies, Gabriel and Peaches. So those are uh, kind of my passion and joy. Hobbies, I'm one of those that loves everything but not good at anything. So golf, hiking, fishing, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that's probably enough about me. Travel all over the place like you. Can't sit very well for very long. You know, got to keep moving. So I think that's the highlights. Well, it's interesting because we share an affinity on a number of those things. And on the hobbies side, I like to say that I try everything and I'm not good at anything. So, I mean, it just it it, it just it it just it just kind of uh, falls. I had forgotten about uh, Gabriel and Peaches um, uh, and, 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 and the importance of those. And the fact that you have a household of four daughters, that is double the two that I have that literally I had hair when I yeah. first started many, many years ago, but that's, I guess that's a separate conversation for a separate yeah, time. Yeah, it's a, yeah, you know the drill then, you know the drill. <laughs> so so let's talk about your your specific technology journey, John. You've always had, in uh, way back when you were an executive with SunTrust back in the day, there was always some degree of interaction with technology. Yeah. Um, what has that John Ainsworth path been from beginning to 2023 look like? Well, First of all, it's been a journey and a lot of change over that, right? So we can go through. So I I actually went into SunTrust, actually late 80s, early 90s, and started off as a correspondent banker. 
And I think the relevance of that is I've always loved community institutions and their passion for inclusion. So as we kind of go through technology and the different kind of iterations, you're going to hear a theme for me that it's always been about inclusion. How could you actually make better of someone's life? And so with SunTrust, it was an interesting uh, time. We went through a lot of acquisitions and mergers like any other regional institution. So uh, my famous SunTrust story, though, is I actually got to uh, to be with the chairman just by coincidence, and he needed a ride to one of his resort places, and I was in my 20s. And I'm like, you know, what's the secret of banking? Right. So I thought it was a very clear point. It was a great question for that age. And, and he pondered for a second, and he said, hmm, 363, 3% deposits, 6% loans, golf course, three o'clock. <laughs> that was, so of all the years from SunTrust and all the things that I touched, that's what I mostly walked away with, 363. <laughs> and what's crazy, Andrew, is after all those years and all the cycles of 08, and then here we are, three, you know, 3% deposits. Actually, I can get better than that right now with 0.1. You know, 6 percentage loans have not gotten to the golf course at three o'clock yet. So I'm two for three. <laughs> That's fantastic. I we're gonna to need to call that out on the three six three component because <laughs> I love numbers. Numbers sometimes love me and sometimes don't love me, but yep. I, I'm gonna to have to keep that going. Although my three o'clock, as we've talked numerous times, is certainly not gonna be on the golf course only because my golf is not game and it's that, that's a longer story. So we'll 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 leave that as a separate piece. So you started off with Sun Trust and and the kind of it sounds like learning the ropes from a good mentor and then yep. spent some time at Visa and at MasterCard and have been not only the entrepreneurial startup. So you, you've seen kind of the Fortune 50 ways of doing things and then sure. the startiest of startups. What, what does that path look like? The journey was very interesting. At the time I went to Visa, it was an association model, right? And most people didn't know at that time that it wasn't a publicly traded company. It was an association uh, based on your membership. The founder of Visa ultimately became one of my mentors. We can talk about D at some point if it's relevant in the conversation. But it was really about kind of expanding the financial services and benefits of members. And so I went into Visa at a very interesting time. It was when the Atlanta Olympics of 96 had started. And at the time, there was kind of a re-emergence of debit. And at that time, most of the you know community and financial services was like debit. Why would you ever do debit? Credit's king, right? Why would you ever like basically just not use somebody else's float? Back to the inclusion angle, well, not everybody had a credit card, right? And not everybody could get the kind of credit aspirations. And so there was a big push on debit. And so that was really kind of the replacement of checks. And you know, as you know, we're still trying to replace check. But in terms of that convenience, more safe, secure kind of experience, that was part of it. And so I started off on the brand side with some of the more regional institutions and ultimately went on the processing side. And that was kind of an interesting technical journey uh, because, again, it was debit. But it was also things, for example, like e-check. It was the first electronic point of sale where you didn't get a check returned back to you at a, at a convenience store or a grocery store or Walmart. You actually, you know, it was a digital receipt. You didn't get the paper back. So as we kind of moved to that electronic medium, debit and kind of that, that was the first centric part of kind of Visa. That makes sense. It does. And it's interesting on several different fronts because you just talked about a number of technologies that, and I'm going to use checking as an example. Growing up, Back in the day, getting your first checkbook was almost yep. a rite of uh, it was a rite of passage, and the 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 old advice was never ever ever get your checks that start with one or one oh one. Right, you have no credibility there, right? It, yeah, and it's like okay, so this is your first check, and you know, and everything, and and just thinking back to that, and now do I have a checkbook? Yes, I do. Whenever I have to get it out, it typically drives me nuts. I've got the checkbook on one hand, which it's a matter of, all right, who am I writing to? And we're not even going to talk about my handwriting, but right. being able to get it. And then if you, if it's a long check that you're writing and all of a sudden you run out and you try and squiggle in this much and this much, let's right. just tear it up and try again. Just very, very frustrating. Was a pretty straightforward experience. And I may or may not have gotten a check from my parents that I may or may not for an advance for Father's Day. So my own parents send me a check for Father's Day, which I found oh, that's hysterical. Cool. It's, it's just awesome. It's supposed to be reversed. It's just kind of <laughs> so what do I do? I'm, I'm taking care of a bunch of stuff. And last night, and I, I endorse it. And the bank, because my handwriting is so bad, cannot read my endorsement of the check. Yeah. So it's a, and it's a hundred percent on me. Same. I take full responsibility of it, but yeah. how ineffective that 
a check was written, it was mailed, it was received, it was opened, and then signed. And then you now, fortunately, instead of having to take it to the bank and deposit it, you can you now have you can take the picture and it automatically does the check. Yeah. However, I wasn't able to do that because I tried four times to take a picture until I got frustrated and said, you know what, I'm not going to deal with this. Yeah. The difference is. And I sent literally, and I taught my parents this, and I'm very proud of this. I told them the magic of using technologies like Venmo. And they got on their phone, click, click, boom. It's yeah, done. Amazing, right? And we've talked about that in so many of our previous live casts about the easy button or the simple, straightforward, more efficient ways of doing things. And I love how you talked about we're still trying to get rid of checks. They're, they're not. Well, um, they're right. And it's crazy that they still exist, but yet they still do exist. I'm curious to see what other technologies, especially since you've done quite a bit on the credit and debit side, and you also have done quite a bit, especially on the authentication side, on this personalization and privacy. What have you seen stuff that you were doing in the 90s that has just been radically and massively changed here now that we're in 2023? So that's a great question. I think if you think about just even the point of sale experience, right? So we were just talking check. Well, one of the other things that I had with SunTrust was payments. And that was literally still in the days of the knuckle buster, right? The zip zap machines where you had to fill out and you got the carbon copy, right? The, the knuckle busters, right? And so one of the first you know, jobs I had for authentication was actually deploying the POS terminals. They didn't actually process the payment, but instead of the card warning bulletins that you had to look up to like look through the numbers, right? You actually could at least put in a number through an authorization system and it would give you a code. And that was the first way to start authenticating a, a transaction so that you had some evidence that, okay, we know John exists and we know John's in good standing and at least this card hasn't been reported or stolen, right? So, so contrast that with the experience you just talked about where I'm scanning phone to phone and it's immediate payment not only the authentication side, but on the actual payment processing side and the immediacy of funds availability. You know, I don't have to put a check in there and wait three or four or five days to, to actually process it. So, so that's kind of on the kind of the payment side or the experience side. The other unique thing is the fraudsters. They haven't gone away and they've, they've kind of walked along with the technology advancements as well, right? So everything we did to try to prevent something from fraud, and this goes back to the authentication part, right? They were right there in step and, and barrel trying to basically, you know, thwart that. So if you look at those kind of two extremes for the 90s and what the extreme is today, it's just night and day, but the principles are still the same, right? I make deposits, I make withdrawals, I transfer funds. You know, the other fund when we uh, all tip on was uh, prepaid. So that was one of my other kind of fun, right? And, and yet again, prepay was like, why would you get some money in advance, right? So it was kind of like pay before, pay now, pay later type thing. Pay before was, you know, kind of prepaid, pay now was debit, pay later was credit. And so the first experience with Visa, we launched a team card called Visa Bucks. And that was actually my nickname was Johnny Bucks. We launched a team card. Card. Um, Johnny Box, I still hear resonated. They're like, oh, Johnny Box. It was kind of a, I, I will say it was one of the, the product failures in life. And so one of those things and, you know, kind of practicality made perfect sense. It's a team card. We're going to give them ways for tools and education. I mean, one kind of fatal flaw, though, teams don't want you to know where they're spending their money. Right. And so we gave cash back for the card. And all they did was like, great. Thank you for the birthday money, the 50 bucks in the team card. Let me go to an ATM and get the money out. And, you know, so. So prepaid was one of those kind of interesting learning experiences as well, because you started to see this kind of segmentation based on what I needed to do. Again, pay before, pay now, pay later, and the technologies. And now when you think about Venmo, right, and immediately for that kind of payment transfer, Zelle, et cetera, Cash App's a big one now, right? So if you think about those kind of utilities where I'm seeing the, the same premise, I want to pay money, I want to borrow money, I want to transfer money, the mediums of exchange have evolved just tremendously between like the 90s and, and today. And it's only going to get even more fun, right, I think. Yeah, so mediums of exchange. It, it's interesting because we have this concept of a, a U.S. dollar as an example. And if, and if I possess it, it is mine. If I decide that I need to get that to you, there are a variety of ways that I can actually get this $1 bill to you. If we were in the same room, which we're not, I could literally hand you the bill, you take it, and it's now yours. Human to right. human, 
It's a simple transfer and it's as easy as it can be. I can then, from a variety of different ways, I could mail you a dollar. And with the postal service being the way that it is, you'll get it sometime between seven days from now. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A, a week for a day just after never from now that you might get that. So again, not very effective. It's left me, it hasn't received you. You're going, hey man, where's a dollar you owe me? And I'm like, right. I put it, the check's in the mail. Or in this case, yeah. the, the dollar's in the mail. Yeah. There's other ways I could take it to a bank, deposit it, and send a wire transfer again oversimplifying quite a bit, but there's lots of different ways that I can get the dollar bill from me to you. Technology <clears throat> payments in particular are trying to facilitate that flow. And I know the business models of the visas and the MasterCards and even a lot of the payment providers and especially the banks. I mean, bill pay from a banking perspective or a credit union perspective used to be the way to create stickiness. If I'm going to want to pay John on a regular basis, well, I'm going to enter in his information and his account information. And whenever I'm paying bills twice a month, I'm going to go into my uh, bank account and I'm going to log into my bank account and pay my bills to John on a regular basis. Well, bill pay didn't die, but it's in many cases very, very, it, there, there's just many, much many, many more effective ways of doing that. So we've seen this. I've got a dollar, I need to get it to John, transform in so many different ways. And that's just a dollar bill. When we look at other means of currency, when we look at crypto, something that I know that you've got quite a bit with, we talked about it quite a bit and it's it's had one of these interesting last couple of years associated with it, especially with the SEC chairman just having a good old fun time of it last week. So my comment to you specifically, and I'll just now go with Johnny Bucks going forward because I'm not going to forget that one. You like that name, right? <laughs> I do. I, I love that one. Um, or my question to you, John, is, and let's talk specifically payments. Check back in the 80s and 90s. That was the best way to transfer money if you're not doing cash. Right. In 2023, we've got a lot of different options to transfer money in its various forms. What are you seeing relative to the payments side of the industry happening? And, and what are the biggest trends you're seeing there? Well, it's interesting. And I will bring back my mentor for a second. So Hawk, the founder of Visa. One of the reasons why I reached back out to him was his definition and mission was to create the platform for the value of exchange. And that value in exchange could evolve to be whatever it needed to be. But it was how do you have that kind of platform that creates that value? And I say that because the platforms have evolved as well, right? So you had the Fed and you had ACH as part of the platform. Bringing that to your question, what I see now is, first of all, the immediacy of payments, right? Because there was always this concept of float that that dollar bill, I had to wait for that value to basically be received before I could actually exchange it for something, purchase of goods or something, right? So there was that, that time of period of delay between when you wanted to send payment and I wanted to receive payment. So that was one part. And then there was also the fraud and risk, right? So in your example, the dollar bill, somebody could have stole the envelope, right? Somebody could have actually kited a check, right? Some, somebody could have forged my identity. So what I see now is the immediacy of payments, but also the enhanced ability for me to know that it's Andrew on one side and it's John on the other side. So I have the immediacy of payment, but I have the ability to authenticate the people on both sides of that, right? So I have that immediacy and that security. That, that's kind of what I see right now in terms of payments. I also see a lot of disruption in terms of who those intermediaries were, right? And that was part of the excitement for me about blockchain was this concept of peer-to-peer, -peer, right? Because in our world, there was always a switch. There was always an intermediary, right? So to get to you, I had to go to a Visa switch. I had to go to a MasterCard. I had to go to a processor. You know, this is this is almost like old as new with the first credit unions, right? It's peer-to-peer. -peer. You and I can exchange value as long as we have an internet connection. We're good. You know, we don't necessarily need an intermediary like we did before, and that ability to have that, that's that's part of it. The other part of payments that's fascinating is everything was always centralized, right? So the data, the money, you know, the ledger, it was always centralized. So this premise of DeFi and the decentralization of finance and the fact that I no longer have this center honeypot, that's fascinating to me. You know, and of course, the whole virtual AR and, and the types of form of how I actually do a payment, you know, a wearable, iris, biometric voice, all of the ways that I actually do that as opposed to what used to be a card as a form factor. You know, now the form factors have now evolved to where I can tap a cufflink to pay, right? I can, all these different form factors have evolved as well. 
So it's really dynamic and really complex. And now you bring in the advent of quantum and the speed of immediacy. I think it's even going to be faster, you know. Excellent. Answer to your question, Andrew. But uh, you know what? But it actually just exploded into a whole variety of other different areas, which is just awesome. And this is exactly where. Welcome I to my head, Andrew. Welcome to I'm, my head. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to USB port into it, and then I'm going to pull, quickly pull it out because I realize there's no way that I'm going to understand half of what's in there. So it's interesting because we talked, yep. and in this case, now what we're diving into, and I love that we're diving into it. It's the humanization of how, in this case, we're doing money transfers, something that is in many cases, well, in all cases, everybody, it's important for money to be flowing. Hopefully there's more innies than there are outies. And that's a, that's a, that's a good way to run your life. But from a, from a monetary transfer perspective, we had this analogy that I had given of, if I see John and I owe John a dollar, I recognize John because I, I've seen you before, I've heard your voice, I know your mannerisms, I know how you act, I, I, I know that, and, and vice versa. It's one of these that we know each other, we have that, that visceral connection of human-to-human contact. And I walk up to you and say, hey, John, I owe you a buck, here you go, hand you the dollar, transaction over. Now, let's say that we're involving a third party with that. We've now got Jane that's involved, and that you and I have done some business together, and that we've decided that we've put this together and that we need to pay Jane. Neither of us ever met Jane, but right. we know that she's set up as an entity. We think we've seen her picture on LinkedIn or we've seen her on a potential Zoom or a call. And then we can set up the appropriate traps relatively quickly to establish a payment type facilitated transaction, leveraging technology, log into the bank account, set up the account, use whatever means necessary, can Venmo, Zelle, PayPal. There's a variety of different ways. And again, we could write her a check, but that has evolved quite a bit. And now we've got new forms of currency. We've got new means of authentication. And we've just created additional complexity of there was two that knew each other. Now there's a third, Jane. How do we know that Jane is who she says she is? How do we make sure we've got the right establishment of a relationship there? And then how are we facilitating the funds? Again, leveraging technology for that humanization side. So using that as an example, John, from a know your customer, from a authentication, from a monetary transfer, what have you seen kind of how that's ha- how that has evolved over the course of the last, even call it three to five years? So I'll start with credit for a second, right? So that's the first one. And I'll actually contrast back to the 90s to now, right? So in the old school days as a lender, we had the five C's of credit, right? Credit, capital, right? Character, exact. You know, so those those were all kind of subjective, if you would. You know, we don't have that necessarily in lending. And now we have an empirical score based on behaviors that are accumulated. And I say now Andrew is an 805, right? And I don't know that Andrew is a great family guy, where he lives, what is, you know, I don't know that about Andrew. Andrew's an 805. And that's basically how I make my decision in the platform. So, so that part of the valuation, I'm using data to decide how I allow Andrew to access his financial services. That has some big implications, right? And so the, the, the sense of that I want to have a better life, I want the convenience and access. But now I have this, this kind of technology and data tools that are imported on this. There's pretty big implications. You know, I use it for credit, but I'll start off the second, and this goes back to inclusion. Depending on your number, there's 2 billion people in the world that are outside of the system right now that can't have access to traditional financial services. And the biggest reason is because we can't authenticate them, right? We can't associate an identity with them that says, okay, I know this is Andrew, right? In the traditional sense. And one of the, the case and points that we're actually working with is nonviolent uh, parolees, right? You're, you're coming out of the, the prison as, as kind of a reformed person. But we say, you know what, you don't, you don't have a driver's license. You don't have a passport. You don't have any credit. And so, therefore, we really can't give you the reason to give you that checkbook or a debit card or a credit card. Well, if you're incarcerated, first of all, I know who you are. right? So it's not like that you don't have an idea. I know exactly where you where you lived and where you were. And you may have actually had a job inside that, you know, you've got some sort of income. And, and that's demonstration of, of an attribute. You may have been on time. You may have got continuing education. And so there's attributes that from kind of an authentication side that that should be able to enhance your life. So, so you know, I want to park there for a second, because this may take a little bit different you know, direction than what you wanted to question. But if I focus on that kind of proof of who you are and that authentication, and that identity, 
that allows you to participate in something. Now, going back to the exchange of value. Well, first of all, I've got to say you're worthy to actually come into the equation and you and I are even going to exchange something. And that's the first part. So, so let me park there because that, that, again, that's kind of a complex answer to your question. It's interesting. And I think the the value chain that you're specifically talking about, John, in terms of so many different facets or factors that are involved at the root of it all is the fact that one human is trying to do something else with another human. What we can do in 2023 is radically different than what we could do 5, 10, 20, 25 years ago. We were limited in our options. Now there's so many different options that it almost is hard to stay on top of what's the easiest, fastest, best way. And you've got, in this case, financial institutions that are clawing, fighting, scraping for, and I'll go back to your 363, trying to get those deposits, trying to get those loans. Right. The Fed is dramatically impacting things by having made the 15 or so rate increase bumps over the course of the last <laughs> right. year, where people are like, yeah, I'm not as interested in that car. That house, hmm, maybe it's not as interesting as it is, again, to kind of rein in inflation. So, but then you've got, you've got the banking system that there was quite a bit of fur around Silicon Valley and Signature, which were overexposed, a lot of risk profile, a lot of issues associated with that. There was some genuine fear that you had and technology companies being very well affiliated with Silicon Valley Bank when you have the folks that are either the venture capitalists or the CEOs of the companies that have their money at the banks all going, go, go now and get your money out. Right an old fashioned bank run. And the bank's like, hey, wait a minute, this can't happen. Again, you've got this value chain of a human to human trying to send money, but then you've got where the system breaks down because of a lack of confidence, which is essentially exactly what happened with, in my opinion, with Silicon and Signature and uh, the other folks that were involved. Sure. Too many folks taking money out And now the macro uh, result of that is you've got a lot of credit unions and financial organizations, smaller to medium sized folks who are quite, quite concerned about everything going to the big four. Right. Because, oh, I know my money will be safe with those guys. Sure. So and I know we're we're going in an entirely different direction here, but I kind of like where the direction is going here, because now we're not just talking about human to human connectivity, but we're talking about human to human connectivity with the trust and level of confidence that is needed in the systems and the processes in order for a transaction to occur. And if that trust and that confidence doesn't exist, then as we saw four or five months ago, the system breaks and it causes a bit of a panic. Sure. Love to get your take. And I know that was such a wide range of stuff, John. You can choose on the transaction, the policies, the confidence or the breakdown. I'm curious to get your take on that. Well, I'll put my, my old school banker hat on a second again, though, back in the correspondent days. You know, there was a term ALCO. There was ALCO committee and it was asset liability committee. And it was effectively where you talked about, OK, how are we managing this environment? And what are the rate conditions? What are we doing with kind of the, you know, the assets and the liabilities? And how are we making sure that we have the adequacy from the capital requirement so we can defend against one of those types of scenarios? You know, and, and the present day, I don't hear Alco a lot anymore, right? In these conversations, that's me I'm like, so in the in the kind of the post review, my first question was, where was the Alco committee, right? Because these are the executive of the banks, typically could have been an outside auditor, it could have been a board of director. And that was the specific conversation is how are we capitalized and have the adequacy to make sure we can meet the demands of our customers, given whatever scenarios. And and one of the, the most fun in banking school, I actually failed the bank in a virtual setting. And I literally misplaced a, a decimal point. What was really supposed to be, and I forget what the number was, but let's just say I was supposed to actually transfer $1,000 and it was $100,000, right? It was that kind of just decimal area. And it actually caused the bank failure. And I literally had the FDIC auditor in, in our virtual setting. And I had to come out with basically a capital adequacy plan to pull this bank out of insolvency. I was only 19. And so I'm like, okay, that's kind of why I got oriented with payments. I'm like, okay, I don't like that part of the banking business. That kind of sucks. But I have an empathy when I hear something like a signature in SVB because I go back and say, you know, there's some principles there that certainly got lost in the excitement and, and all of the, you know, the, the shiny objects. But there's still some basics. And it always goes back to trust. 
And what's fascinating, Andrew, is now you have people that are coming up as young millennials to say, you know what? I think Bitcoin or Ethereum is more safe than my institution because at least I know I can get to my Bitcoin and I have the ability to transfer. It may fluctuate in value, but I can get to it. And I'm not sure that if I needed to get my money out of my local institution, that that's safe. And the fact that they're putting the same trust level on those two kind of you know institutions, that just baffles me because that just blew out 40 years of my banking career and establishing trust and said, you know what, there's a new net neutral, a new norm. And what we used to trust in the institutions, if you would, it doesn't exist. And then you play on something like Estonia, right, as a country, and we can get there in a second, where it's fully digital. There's really no thought of a banking system as we think about it, you know. So the whole trust factor for me is just fascinating in an SVB model because environments change, rates change, right? And I'm empathetic because, you know, institutions have a lot of change. And I'm seeing a lot of CEOs retire because, you know, you know what? it's been a long time since I've had to work through these types of conditions. I'm out. <laughs> let, somebody else, let somebody else come figure out that problem, you know. So I'm empathetic to those institutions, but but, but there's a working model that, that we should have been following more closely, at least in my, you know, Humble opinion. Well, there's the old adage, and you said the ALCO uh, with the Assets and Liabilities uh, Committee. I, I said it in a different way, quite simplistically and 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 just kind of crazily. That um, uh, by the way, it's better if you have more innies than you have outies. If, yeah. Uh, <laughs> if, if, if your outflow it dramatically exceeds your in, inflow, even if it's a million pennies, right? It, it, exactly. It doesn't matter. Something's going to break. And by the way, I think I'm going to have to talk Megan and the producer of our show. The producer of our show relative to the title of this one is going to have to be Johnny Bucks. Johnny Bucks breaks banks. I think that's what we're going to have to do because of... Uh, it has to be an acronym. JB. Yeah, 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 there's, there, yeah, there's an acronym in there that can be trademarked. We can make bumper stickers. It's going to be great. Right. But I think the interesting piece, and I, I want to go back to that for a moment. You're 19 years old and you just made a simple error with a decimal, one type code, one, one single component of that. I mean, you had to be utterly terrified about, and this is some time ago, I, I'm, not, I'm not aging both of us, technology's kind of newer on the scene. What was going on in your head relative to the, oh my gosh, what, did, what just happened? So it was, well, first of all, I was frustrated because the other persons, my age group, they were going out and, and I won't, I won't give you my full age, but let's just say 18 was the legal drinking age, right? So my pals, they got to go out drinking that night. And so my first thought was, okay, I am isolated and now I have a problem and it's on me and you guys are having fun and I'm not. So that was my first, right? So at 19. But the second was, oh my gosh, I didn't understand the frailty in the system that something so you know simple and basic could have such drastic consequences. It just kind of blew my mind. It was kind of like, crap, all right, this is a lot more serious than what I thought it was. And so it was kind of overwhelming in a sense. And the second part was, okay, who do I go to? The guys that actually have the answers that I need are the bad guys, at least in my part, right? So FDIC audit, I'm sure they're great guys, and I'm sure they're after five o'clock, everybody loves them. But most people don't like FDIC auditors, right? That's not. So I'm like, who, who do I go to to help me figure this out? And so it was very overwhelming. And, and like I say, that mindset, you know, it, it was just baffling to me that the consequences of an unintended action was so dramatic that quickly, you know? It's interesting on so many different fronts, but again, and then it gets into a discussion about controls, uh, sure. control systems, um, being able to have the ability for multiple checkpoints to have multiple physical human hands, touch points, whatever it is. Automation is great. And at Tailwind, we're doing automation all the time. I know we've had this conversation quite a bit. If you can take what has been done manually and leverage, I'm going to br bridge the gap here to AI as a great right. example of yeah. this. If you can leverage, whether it's robotic process automation, whether it's generative AI, whether it's some other flavor of making a computer or computing entity leverage zeros and ones, Right. in a faster manner because it's leveraging the collective sense. And there's a lot of big, de big definition of the collective sense of knowledge that's out there to provide me with a valid, faster way of doing something with the right controls and check steps in there to make something happen, which that obviously has exploded with OpenAI from right. chat, with ChatGPT 4.0. And, and it, it's a fun or can be a fun and entertaining tool relative to see. And it's also... 
a real piece where you've got the attorney who utilized uh, on the airline case to cite fake <laughs> cases, which happened a couple of weeks back. You've got the same technology that is passing the bar exam with a high B plus average grade in there. And all of this is happening in the ever iterative environment. And again, technology in this case, possibly overtaking the human. So humanizing software becomes software right. taking over humans. I've made that bold statement specifically, not provocatively, but just because a lot of people are talking about that. What is your take, John? Because I know you're heavily involved and invested in the future and what's happening here. And I'm just going to say, ready, set, go. go. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, first of all, there's there's two converging themes that are going to take us to what I think is this next experience that, I, that I'm most excited about, this next jump. So the advent of quantum, right, both for good and bad, is a pretty major deal. And it's just that increased you know, computer speed that we talk about, right? So the things that we're talking about, AI and chat GPT, and the things that have that kind of real-time quick processing speed, right? So that's that's one, one theme. But then the data speed transmission. So the, you know, we're already talking about, you know, 10G, right? So we're just getting to 5G in the States. You look at the rest of the world, they're already on 10G. So the ability for me to have these processes and algorithms computed so quickly and then the ability for that to be transmitted or, or to make decisions, it's almost like that same mistake I made in that FDIC. You know, that wasn't a three, six, nine month period. I made one mistake and boom, it was over. We think about how fast this is moving. And if I use ChatGPT for a certain decision point, or if I used AI, the immediacy and the consequences, it actually makes it more difficult for the controls and balances because I don't have the time to react anymore, right? So I, you know, I think about Skull and he was talking about, you know, landing on the Hudson. Was that a plane land? You know, was that with appropriate? It was the time of the decision that really made if it was a right decision or a bad decision. And so for me on the controls and balances, all of this is, is moving at such an accelerated pace. The controls and balances and the privacy aspect of this to keep up is going to also be a challenge. So you, you did ready, set, aim. That was my ready, set, aim. I do have to tell you two funny stories on Chad GPT. So I did one as a, as a serious one, like what's the benefit of distributed ledger for identity, right? So that that's kind of the useful one. I also took a picture and actually put in my names of my two French bulldogs and said, make me a lullaby of my Frenchie. And so I saw the extreme of, okay, this was useful content. This was, you know, more for entertainment content, but both happened just that fast. And both of them were very dynamic and the accuracy was kind of, you know, I won't be too inappropriate, but even the lullaby actually captured like some of my dog's behavioral habits after they have food, which I'm like, how would they know that that's one of the characteristics of my dogs, that they're creating stinkies everywhere for me after this? That's how we immediately put it in the lullaby, you know, I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool, you know. I may or may not be asking for a copy of that lullaby just because I, I, <laughs> I'll I, I, I see you afterwards. You'll get a kick out of it. I need to see that. But it's interesting. And you bring up an excellent point about the diverse nature of how rapidly things are changing, the acceptability or non-acceptability of, hey, by the way, and when you have a letter that is written by the founder of the founder and a lot of folks that were involved in the early on days of AI that say, right. Hey, by the way, right. perhaps we need to put the brakes on here a little bit because everybody is going to go kind of nuts associated with this. And, and I've seen multiple different instances of that and, of course, read about and experienced. I haven't yet done the distributed lever question, and I certainly haven't put any pets in with yeah. lullabies, <laughs> although the challenge is now on and it has been stated. So, okay. But again, it speaks to this concept of we have more computing power access and leverage on June the 13th of 2023 than ever before in the history of mankind. Right. And oh, by the way, it'll be changed tomorrow and the day after tomorrow and the week after tomorrow and the month after tomorrow. So we've got this concept of human beings. Now nah, we've got this, we're in control of the situation. And we're going to continue to leverage technology. We're going to continue to leverage both hardware and software to work for us. And that is definitely happening. What are some of the dangers that you're seeing that are specifically out there, John, about maybe some major watchouts that are kind of at top of mind for you? 
Skynet. <laughs> <laughs> the Terminator is real. Yeah, right? 1984. I mean, you think about it, though. I mean, you know, how futuristic did we think about that? And the fact that, you know, some, you know, one being able to take over and weaponize kind of this community. And they think of now of like, oh, my gosh, you know, it, what seemed inconceivable is now conceivable. Jetsons, what seemed inconceivable is now seems conceivable. And so for me, I think it's kind of like, wow, we're losing control. You know, I think that for me is kind of that kind of, wow, when I look out and see like who the bad actors are and how do I prevent, you know, bad things from happening from things that were intended for good, you know, it's kind of enemy of the state, minority report, right? So you go back to all these that we look back and said, you know, okay, you're taking my eyeball out kind of for authentication and Granted, you know, a lot of fantasy element, but you start to think, huh, that's not inconceivable anymore, right? So I think for that, for me, it's an interesting fact. What my grandfather retired from NASA. I actually have a coin actually from the first Apollo 11 when it came back to Earth. And so I've always had that kind of fascination with their aeronautics. And you think about the exploration and the things that we're seeing now actually with, you know, even beyond Hubble right now, you just think about the expansion and, and, and what we're seeing. We're losing control. Maybe it's just my age, Andrew, because I'm kind of moving that last season, right? I'm, I'm not 19 anymore, and I'm like, oh, crap. You know, I'm losing control, and I'm not sure the next 19-year-old is going to keep me safe, right? We will be fighting for the title of crankier old man. Uh, we, we, will, we will definitely be doing that because I do feel that, that is, that's happening, and there's so many different challenges that are associated with it. And, oh, by the way, just as with there's the potential for bad, there's also right. the potential for good. Absolutely. Let, let, let's look at some of the new AI-powered robotic technology tools that are able to do surgeries that are so much more precise than, than ever could be. The AI that is associated with taking and at some point enabling the airplanes can go on autopilot and have for decades. Right. C cars are working towards. Mm -hmm. uh, Elon Musk and others have been having this conversation specifically about uh, leveraging and taking cars and driverless cars. Um, I passed one last night on my way home and it, again, a double take associated with it. And yet the opportunity for leveraging that technology will 10, 20, 30, 40 years, whatever it may be from now, the opportunity for all of us humans prone to extreme error, will that help us by being able to reduce car accidents, make the roads safer, make heck, maybe roads, we're doing the whole Star Wars thing, multiple layers of capability. The vision, the future, everything that's associated with that is again, based off of technology. But yet we have this key component that is so important that is associated with how do we make sure that we keep the humans in technology? Sure. And that that brings up, I mean, our, our humanizing software is obviously everything that we've been doing, saying, and being a part of. Yet we have this tagline called people-driven tech. Mm -hmm. We've mentioned it a couple of times, but it is, and it, literally 18 months ago when we started this with episode one uh, with Harsha Balor way back in the day, the CIO of James Avery, right. we've always talked about people-driven tech. When those three words come to your mind, John, what does people-driven tech mean to you? People-driven, people, well, the people quotient being the most important part of that, right? So when I think about that statement, I really think about, I want the control, flexibility, access, and security to meet the needs of, of what I need, right? So in terms of financial services, right, that's one dimension. If it's, I want to go to a doctor and have a an accurate audit or assessment about my state of health. If I actually want to go get in a car and actually drive, I want to know that that car is not going to be hacked and driven off the road, right? So for me, it's that personalization, making the immediacy, giving the convenience, but in a safe, simple, secure way, right? So when I think about that, that statement you made, that's kind of what comes to top of mind. But the people factor is obviously there. I want to be the center of any of this, right? I don't want to have someone else being the center. I want to be the center of controlling my life. So it, it again is, it's about what I'm hearing is the humans, the people, us, need to continue to be driving forward, being at the stick, the, the, the control factor of as long as we're keeping humans helping define and run the processes, the control factors and everything associated with that, we can help manage the technology effectively. Is that an accurate statement? 
it is, and I'll leave you with this last as kind of the second part of that is I want all of these in this humanization kind of mentality. I want you to make me better connected with my friends, family, and community, right? Authentic community is something actually is the adverse of all this. I actually want this to be a driver to help me create more authentic community, keep me more connected, right? If you're in Europe and I'm here, I want to be able to, to have that same sentiment as if you and I were in the same room from a connected community. So that's the other aspect of the growing. So this this concept of interconnectivity, um, and we're gonna we're gonna wrap up on this because I'm gonna have to have Sean, you're coming back. We're gonna have a part two and a part three. We're gonna do this all over the ocean. The next one, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, we're gonna have our own service. Uh, the J Triple B uh, Johnny Bucks breaks banks uh, uh, concept. No, I, I, the the concept that you just mentioned, I think, is so important because it's important to the uh, the people side of the equation. And I know I've I've seen you do and live and exude this as a as a person. Is it, it's the authenticness, it's the genuine sense of caring, it's the authenticity that's associated with who you are at your core, your values, your beliefs, the systems that are so unique to you. That it's what I know that I'm talking to John Ainsworth, and I respect John saying we're John Ainsworth because of who he is who I've known him to be and who I know other people also believe him to be as well. And it's that unique, authentic connection that usually starts with trust and respect, Absolutely. but also, and, and, and that, that, that trust and respect is something that is so critically important on so many different fronts. And yet we also have the opportunity to keep the humanity side into it where if one of us sees the other in need, offering or lending a hand to help with the genuine authentic means with which to actually fulfill that, that to me is where, that's where the magic really occurs. I totally agree. Totally agree. Great way to end the conversation. That is, that is absolutely the case. So as we wrap up today, John, I cannot begin to tell you again how much I've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation, the beginnings of the conversation as it continues. We covered off a wide range of ideas and options. And for those that are out there listening in now or listening in in the future, we invite you to please engage with us. Continue the conversation with John. Continue the conversation with me. Continue the conversation on humanizing software. We've got our website at tailwindsw.com. So as we sign off today, we want to wish everybody a very, very good morning, a good afternoon, and a good evening. Have a fantastic day. Thanks for joining us on another episode of Humanizing Software with Andrew Tall. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time.